Paula says her disappointed fans deserve an explanation, but for the moment even she doesn't know why her race went so disastrously wrong. I was just like, no, I mean, I was almost unable to cry, I'm probably more able to today, but um, last night I was just in such shock and I just, I mean, I just felt like I'd let everyone else down, but nobody was hurting inside as much as I was. What went wrong in the build-up? Where did that injury come from? And how did we find ourselves on that fateful day in Athens with you unable to finish the race? Um, I mean, I think that's the, the million dollar question there. Um, there are lots of reasons why athletes get injured and we all probably beat ourselves up afterwards looking back and thinking, well, what if? And sometimes there are things that you can do to avoid it um, and some things there aren't. I think for me, actually, it was a, a combination of, of things building into that race um, in 2004. We decided not to race the spring marathon. So I was really aiming for the World Cross Country that year and picked up a hernia. Um, in It would have been March time. Um, so I was operated on for the hernia, back into training fairly smooth. Looking back now, that just meant that I didn't go to the World Cross Country. I didn't take my usual break after the World Cross Country. So I was kind of a month ahead of where I needed to be. Um, mm. And I was in shape too early that year. I think that maybe it was just something simple as my muscle was just a little bit fatigued. And I think that just caused the hematoma that I had underneath my, my quads. It feels like I never really had really straightforward injuries that were diagnosed immediately um, and something we could get over. So we didn't really know what this was. I just remember that huge stress in the Olympic Village uh, of trying to, them trying to book an ultrasound scanner so that they could go in and get rid of the, the hematoma, that not being available. And um, then the, the GP doctor just having to, to basically go in blind and, and just guess where it was to draw off the fluids and then I was on fairly substantial um, anti-inflammatories so it was just basically see what would happen and I think all of that stress meant that um, my stomach rebelled in a big way and I, I wasn't I wasn't absorbing food and I guess looking back that's what I didn't do either I didn't tell my support team I think I felt, thought that they felt they'd had enough to, to deal with. Um, I was telling them how it was feeling when I was able to, to do a little bit of jogging, to do some strides. And I just thought, as so long as I'm taking all of my carbohydrate drinks, then it will be fine come race day. Do you think you should have raced? Had it not been the Olympic Games, would you have raced? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, I think the, the moment that we probably discovered the original injury, you would have just taken time out um, and, just being able to to get more answers to it without that time constraint of it being the Olympic Games. There's always another big city marathon that you can do. There's not always another Olympic Games, particularly when you'd finished fifth in 96, fourth in 2000, and it felt like it was kind of my race to lose that, uh, that year. So I, it also felt like, I guess, I was carrying a whole lot of pressure, but I think the biggest one was for myself, that it was the Olympic Games. It was this dream I'd had since an 11-year-old child. Uh, and I just really wanted to go there and win the Olympic Games. People had hung a medal around your neck. They were billing this race as, everyone come and watch Paula win gold. This is a 26.2 mile procession to the top of the Olympic podium for Paula Radcliffe, our golden girl. I'm just wondering what it's like the night before that race, the, the biggest day of your running career. I think then already a lot of, not what ifs, but a lot of wishing that the build up had been different because I think you can maybe wing it and kid yourself if you're the best in the world in some events, but the marathon isn't one of them. There's never a sure thing with a marathon. Anything can always happen, no matter what kind of shape you're in. I'm usually very good at positive thinking and just thinking, okay, okay, it is what it is now. I need to go out and race as well as I can and to rely on all of the years of training behind. Um, but I think 
it, it was very, very difficult that night because of the, the doubts about whether my leg would be okay, the worry about whether I was absorbing food properly, um, just trying to sleep when you just know that the buildup has, has not gone well. I was really just thinking, okay, maybe, maybe it's just all been sent to test me and that this has been a real suffer through the buildup because things are going to work out tomorrow. Um, but I think I was really just trying to, to kid myself a little bit there. But what I was trying to do was just think about all of the good training that I had put in earlier uh, and just hope that I could pull it together despite what had happened in that last um, three weeks or so. As you tow the start line, has the kidding yourself worked? How firmly do you still hope and believe that you can come away with this title? I was really just thinking about putting myself in the best frame of mind and committing myself in the best way to, to run the race. So I was doing all the right things there, trying to, to stay cool, trying to keep um, drinking, to, to keep taking my, my carbohydrate drink. I just remember feeling very, very cold at the start, even though it was the hottest day, um, because I'd been in the ice bath before and I, I just couldn't get warm, which looking back is a sign that my energy levels weren't high enough um, and then when there was a little bit of a breakaway and I tried to cover it towards the crest of the hill I remember feeling like I was running out of energy but thinking okay well once I get to the top of the hill it's pretty much downhill to the finish so I'm always going to be able to do that but I, I, I just couldn't. Had that happened to you before? I mean you were undefeated at this stage in the marathon how scary an experience was that to suddenly not have the power to respond to someone making a move? Yeah, it, it was scary because, I mean, it had happened to me before lots of times, I guess in other road races and on the track. In the marathon, it hadn't yet happened to me like that. It had happened to me in training where I'd feel like I was really going through rough patches. That would happen frequently in training, um, but I would usually be able to, to, to come through those. So I think to begin with, I thought, okay, this is just the same as any other time in training. You just need to, to kind of, go to that concentration place um, just keep focused on, on the moment right now and just just try and come through it. But what was concerning was that I, I wasn't coming through it. It was getting worse. I think the hardest part for me was when I realized that I couldn't hold a straight line. So I found myself running in the gutter. I would try and get myself back to the middle of the road. And then suddenly I would be back um, running in the gutter again and almost like not have any control over where my legs w were taking me. So it start. I, I don't know how to describe it. It almost starts to feel like a little bit fluffy, a little bit woolly, like you're, you're there, but you're not really there. Like those, I guess uh, other athletes have had in those horrible dreams where you're, you're trying to, to get to the finish and make your body move, but your body just won't move. Um, and this was actually in the race uh, and in the biggest race of, of my life. I did stop the first time, I was completely exhausted, but then something in me was, you know, I have to, I have to try and, and keep going. I have to try and keep moving. But when I started back, it was even worse. Uh, and I, I just, I just couldn't do it. Looking back, that is now properly hitting the wall. And it's probably the only time I've properly hit the wall that people talk about when you have no energy left in your body. So it wasn't the actual injury. It was the fact that I, I just had no, nothing there. I've been back time and time again in my mind I know I was called a quitter a lot at the time and criticized for, for stopping but I just think something in my mind kicked in in self-preservation and just I, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to finish and that I wasn't going to push my body to, to complete collapse um, that day. You cross the road to move away from the spectators and sit down on the pavement, your head in your hands. It's such a powerful and instantly recognizable image. If you can describe those moments on the curb for us. I can't really see, I, I can't remember crossing the road. I thought I just sat down. Um, I, I can't remember crossing. I do remember at some point, two of my former teammates from Bedford County who were actually out there supporting did find me. And I, I remember them putting an arm around me I don't remember um, much um, about kind of how I got from when I stopped and sat down to being back in the stadium and to Gary finding me, to my mum and dad being able to, to, to find me. 
for anybody who runs a marathon and drops out of a marathon, you don't really want to know what the what the protocol is um, for if you drop out because it's not part of the race plan, it's not part of the strategy. Um, so I never really listened to what you should do if you drop out of the race because no, I, I didn't want that to ha happen to me. Um, and so yeah, I didn't really know what to do. I think I just sat down because it, I just couldn't stand up was seeing Gary and seeing your parents exactly what you needed and wanted at that moment or did you want to just be by yourself and not see these people for whom you were probably running they must have been a great driving force for you in the hairy moments during that yeah. race yeah hugely um and I think yes it's feeling their disappointment as well but I mean of course um nothing helps more than a hug from people that you love um, when you're that low. So what I didn't want to be on my own. I don't think I really wanted to be anywhere other than back out on the road racing. It couldn't make things all right again, um, but it certainly could help. If you'd been any other competitor in that field and that had happened to you, you could have seen your team doctor return to the athlete's village and licked your wounds, but you were Paula Radcliffe, so you had to face the media. How soon was the first microphone stuck under your nose? How quickly did you have to collect yourself and be able to articulate what that experience was like? Um, I think it was the next day. I think I, I was able to first get checked out by the doctor, get back to, to the village. Um, I think they were very keen that I should try and get some sleep. I don't think I was able to get very much sleep at all. I was just like, no, Mark, I mean, I was almost unable to cry, I'm probably more able to today, but um, last night I was just in such shock and I just, I mean, I just felt like I'd let everyone else down, but nobody was hurting inside as much as I was. I think, ladies and gentlemen, you are, if you just give us a few moments. Obviously, the emotions were far too raw and it was too soon for me to in any way be able to handle or to get a handle on, on what really had happened, what had gone wrong and to be able to express that. Um, I am quite an emotional person anyway, and to be able to to manage those in front of the media was always going to, to be a big ask. It took me months to, to fully put things together um, and to answer the question of whether I had done serious damage to my body, which is what I think I was one of the things I was most scared about after the race. Yes, there was all the trauma of missing out on my best chance at the Olympic Games and not being able to finish the race. But I was also really worried, would I be able to run again had I seriously damaged my health? That's why it was so important to me afterwards to be able to get the answers to those questions, gradually get back into, into running and then to race again when I was ready well, you speak about readiness. Surely, Paula, there was no way that mentally, emotionally, physically, you were ready to compete in that 10K. Why did you? I think the one thing I always have been very good at is knowing myself um, and knowing what I can cope with and what I can't cope with. Um, and I think for me, the bigger question and the harder thing to deal with would have been to, to come away from Athens and not to try and race the 10K and to always be going back and asking myself that question, well, what what if I could have done that? What if I would have been able to do that? I can remember having to sit down with um, the Team GB uh, sports psychologist, Steve Peters at the time, because the team management would not let me race until I had spoken with him. Um, and I can remember him asking me, well, what happens if your, your leg hurts or if you can't finish or if you can't run well on top of what's already happened in the marathon what happens then and I remember just turning around to him and being very very clear that the worst had already happened for me um, and that the next worst thing would be to have to sit in the stands and watch the race I just want to see if it's possible if I can in any way pull my body back together and be able to to be competitive in the 10k uh, and I promised them that if I knew I couldn't be or if I felt the leg in any way then I would step off. I did feel my leg but I also knew that I didn't have enough there to be able to, to go with it and at that point it wasn't worth really hurting myself to, to just run around or to just be some kind of uh, pity race. I think I just wanted the answer uh, of whether I could or couldn't so I could stop 
listening to those critiques and beating myself up over whether it was in any way psychological in the marathon. As hard as it is to believe, 2000 was to be your most successful Olympics outing, that fourth place finish in Sydney. 2008, as you mentioned, didn't go away because of a femur injury. 2012, you weren't even able to start because of the foot injury that ultimately brought your career to a close. I think I know the answer to this question, but this podcast is called The One That Got Away. Is an Olympic title the one that's missing from your collection? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, without a doubt. Um, it is um, because I had the I had the world cross country that meant so much to me. I didn't get a world championship on the track, but I got a silver medal. I got the European and Commonwealth Games, which were also extremely important to me. And then I got the world championship title in the marathon, which is on many levels the same standard of competition as the Olympics, but it's not the Olympic Games. I can say that I went to Sydney and I ran as well as I was capable of doing, that I went to Atlanta and I ran as well as I was capable of doing. I wasn't able to do that in Beijing and I wasn't able to, to do that certainly in Athens and I really wasn't able to in 2012. But I think also certainly my mindset as an athlete and as a person is you make you set those goals, you give it the best shot that you can to to try and achieve them. Sometimes you're going to achieve more than you're capable of, um, or than you thought you were capable of, um, and and sometimes you you won't achieve them. But unless you try, you you really won't know. I achieved way way more than I ever dreamed I was capable of doing when I set out on that journey as a as a nine year old, and I wouldn't swap any of those high points for the low points that happened in the Olympic Games. I I wouldn't do that because they meant too much to me, or they mean too much to me. Uh, and I worked far too hard for them. My team worked far too hard for them. Um, so I wouldn't swap any of them. Not even your world record now that Bridget Kosagai has pinched that from you? Not a thing? No, no. In that race in 2003, I couldn't have given any more. I couldn't have run any faster. That was as fast as I was capable of doing on that day. And that was something that I remember clearly going over and over in my head like make this count make this you never know if you're going to be in this position again so get every last ounce of energy out so that somebody's going to have to run very very fast to to take this record away from me now i wanted it to stand for as long as possible uh, and i felt like i did that had someone come out in 2004 2005 and beaten the record maybe i could have done something about getting it back now there's no chance that i can go out uh, and race it and try and get that record back so i think it just it just still has to be something that i'm i'm very proud of i know how hard i worked to do that um, and it will always be my personal best maybe a British record for a little while.